Welcome back folks, my name's Shane. Today I'm gonna to show you how to set up a digital audio workstation for a home studio. If you wanna say record electric guitar, vocals, or produce your own music, this will cover everything you'll need to know. I'm also gonna leave timestamps to everything in the description below. So if you already know about some of it, you can skip ahead to the stuff you might wanna learn more about. This will cover everything from the computer, the type of operating systems you can use, all the way through to the actual software, audio interfaces, microphones, cables, studio monitors, and everything else. Let's get into it. Now the first thing you need to consider is what type of audio interface you'll be using with the computer. Now there's an alternative to this, you can just buy a USB powered microphone that you can then record into it, but it's very limiting and they don't often handle a whole lot of volume. So if you're recording electric guitar, for example, a USB microphone, at least with the ones that I've tried on the most part, aren't the best. And they're also somewhat scooped in the mid frequencies, which might also be a deal breaker. So you wanna get an audio interface. I've had about 10 different ones over the years. The great thing about buying an audio interface in 2020 is they'll work across the majority of the operating systems. You just have to pick which one suits your needs the best and which one also suits your price the best. Now I've tested everything from Behringer all the way through to Motu and more expensive ones including Focusrite and also Steinberg which is what I use and it's currently what I've got on my desk back there. Now you need to decide how many actual inputs you need. This particular one has two microphone inputs that also double as line inputs. It also has something called a high Z input. So if you're recording bass guitar, for example, you can plug directly into this and get a signal straight on your computer thanks to that high Z input. Now, if you're gonna be recording drums, I can highly recommend this. This is the Zoom R16, and this can also be used as a dedicated portable recorder. It runs not only on batteries, it comes with its own power supply. It can also be USB powered. And as you can see down here, we get eight microphone slash line inputs, which are also referred to you see the term XLR input, that means the XLR microphone input. So XLR and mic input are both the same thing. This will record eight tracks simultaneously to the actual computer, or it will do eight tracks internally to an SD card. Now, if you're gonna be setting up a home studio, this is a good option, but there's ones that would save you a whole lot more space than this. And I'll leave some recommendations in the description below to ones that I've personally used and tested. One of the really cool things about audio interfaces is there's something out there for everybody. You can get ones with just a single microphone input all the way up to about 16 and everything in between. There might also be some that do more than that as well out there. But for the home studio user, usually 16 would be way more than enough. Eight is about the majority of what most people would ever need at the extreme. Now, if you are recording and you're a solo acoustic player, you're just thinking to yourself, you know what, all I need is one microphone input. I would say get one that has two. So get a dual microphone input sound card. The reason I'm saying that is if you already perform live and you're a singer, you can do it live. You can put one microphone on the acoustic guitar and one on your voice, or you can dual microphone up the acoustic, which gives you a much better sound if you know what you're doing. That's a bit of a learning curve, but I would always say get a sound card that offers you a little bit more than you need just in case you're really enjoying the whole process and you want to invite someone over and then all of a sudden you're out of inputs and you need a bigger sound card. So just make sure that audio interface suits your needs a little bit more long term than the short term. Let's talk a little bit now about the hardware of the computer. Now one of the really cool things, unlike video editing which I've done for years and I've also produced a whole lot of albums on this computer right here, is the fact you don't need to anything too elaborate as long as it's a multi-core CPU that's at least you know four or five years old or newer you shouldn't have any problems so if you're looking even at putting together a new machine you don't really necessarily need the top of the line Intel or AMD CPUs sure get them if you can afford to and the better the CPU the better the experience will be and the more plugins you can run. Now this computer I put together just for this particular task as well as a few other personal things as well, but mostly just for audio work. And it's an old AMD FX 8350. They're dirt cheap and they work extremely well for audio. It's a multi-core CPU. So just make sure anything from around the FX, AMD FX series or i5 upwards, you're gonna have no problems doing any of this at all. I would say even some of the Intel i3, some of the current ones would have no problems handling any of these audio or digital audio workstation programs. So yeah, don't think you need the top of the line computer like you do when you edit high res 4K or 6K video. You don't need that at all. You just need something that's multi-core. And I would also suggest getting a solid state drive to run your operating system on. 
that always helps. Now, if you can tick those two boxes and get about 16 gig of RAM, you're gonna be in for some really good luck. Now, you might already have a laptop that you wanna do some of this work with. I'm just gonna give you one tip that I, I don't see anyone talk about. Now, if you plug a laptop in, it's generally charging the battery. I've had so many people ring me and say, hey, why is my computer buzzing when I have it plugged in? I'm like, it's a dirty or noisy power supply. Most of the new laptops out there shouldn't have any issues when it comes to actually producing music. But one of the things to watch out for is they can buzz and sometimes that's completely unavoidable. It sucks and it's distracting and it will ruin your music. So the safest thing is to put together a desktop, use an old desktop or buy a used one from somewhere or put together some you know, parts that will do the job. I'll leave a list of what my recommendations in the description below. Now that we have the hardware out of the way, let's talk a little bit about the software that you should be using to record your masterpiece or music or whatever it is you wanna do, podcast, it doesn't matter. Now, all of these programs are inherently very similar to each other, but everybody knows Pro Tools or they've heard of it and they think Pro Tools is the best, right? That's not the case at all. So it doesn't really matter what program you use, as long as you know it and learn it, it makes no difference in the end. I've been using Nuendo, which is a variation on Cubase for over 10 years. And it's great because I know it back to the front. I know it so well that anytime I change to anything else, it takes me a good few minutes to kind of work out where all the options are. I know this back to front after using it for 10 years and it's still serving the purpose for me extremely well. It runs really stable on my computer. It never crashes or does anything weird. So for me, this is a really great choice. But I'm gonna recommend Reaper. Now, if you haven't heard of Reaper, just type in Reaper or I'll leave a link in the description as well. Now, anytime you get a sound card, it generally comes with a light version of something like Cubase or any other number of programs. I would recommend grabbing that and throwing it in the bin because if you want to upgrade, it's going to cost you a fortune. I would say go and get Reaper. And the reason why I'm saying to go get Reaper is it's inexpensive. It's as functional as what I use here as New Window. It's extremely powerful. It's very, very stable. They update it regularly. It will work not only on Windows, but if you're like me and you've got an Apple Mac as well, you can run it on Apple Mac, you can run it on Linux, and it works on lots of different distributions, and it's very, very stable. Now, if you are a Linux user, you do have some different variations of software you can download straight from the app shop, like Adore, which does work pretty well, but I like Reaper better, and the flexibility of being able to change operating systems and have it function the same is why I'm suggesting going for Reaper. It's definitely a better choice if you do have a mix of operating systems like I do here at the house. There's one piece of software that you can't overlook that's essential for all of this to work. And it will help the audio interface not only talk to the computer, but also to plug into the program that you're using to record. And that's the audio driver. Now, the driver is just a piece of software you can get from the manufacturer's website. If someone went out and bought this today, and it came with the same disc that was maybe uh, batched with this box maybe a year ago, for example, you would wanna go to the website and download the most current driver. And these drivers update regularly. Any good sound card manufacturer, whether it's Focusrite, Steinberg, M-Audio, or any of these other brands will continually update the drivers as time goes on. So check back regularly. They just basically squish a few of the bugs and optimize the drivers for the best performance. Without it, it might not work. On a Mac, it can work. On Linux, you don't need any drivers on the most part. A lot of them just work straight out of the box. Let's talk a little bit about workflow and what I've learned over the years. So a little bit of advice, I much prefer working on one large monitor as opposed to having two separate monitors. It stops you having to turn your neck back and forth anytime you wanna look at the different screens and it gives you so much real estate. Now this is a 4K Acer monitor. If you can't afford or you don't wanna get a 4K monitor for whatever reason, then you don't have to, you can get a 1080p one, but I would recommend just getting one large monitor over having two. It will also save you the desk space. If you're on limited space in the room that you're recording, opt for one bigger monitor as opposed to trying to, you know, fit in two smaller ones side by side. Now, if that's already what you've got on your computer and you don't plan to upgrade the monitor at any particular point, that's fine. If you're used to that workflow and you enjoy it, go for it, but for me personally, having everything visible on one screen without really having to do anything is just so much less fiddly when it comes to moving things around. I just much prefer the real estate on this 4K screen. Let's talk about something you definitely shouldn't skimp on when it comes to setting up your digital audio workstation, 
and that is microphones. Now, keep into consideration too, that there's more opinions on microphones than microphones out there in existence. Everyone will tell you something different. This is just my experience. This is one of the lowest noise floor microphones I've ever heard. And it's the one I choose to use on all my vocal applications, whether I'm singing or whether I'm doing a podcast. This is by far my favorite of all time. I've used it on my last three albums, as well as albums I've produced for some of Australia's best blues players. Now, this is a really great mic called the Rode NT1, and it definitely sounds very clear, very clean. It doesn't sound nasty in any sort of situation. So if you're a singer of any description and you're also an acoustic guitar player, I would opt for this. Now there's one small downside of these large diaphragm condenser mics, whether it's this or an Audio-Technica or any other brand, is that they'll tend to pick up more sound from around the microphone than a very directional microphone. So if you're looking for a directional microphone, it doesn't pick up as much background noise. Say so you got a lot of construction going on outside or whatever the case may be, you definitely don't wanna be using something like this. So, or you wanna record at times when it's not really loud around you. If you're looking for a microphone that's more directional, meaning it won't pick up as much ambient noise, I would highly recommend this. I've used this from everything from podcasts to recording electric guitar amplifiers for years, snare drum, hi-hats, live vocals, everything. It works on absolutely everything. One of the really cool advantages of this microphone over the other one is that internally, you can also run this off a nine volt battery if you so choose, or you can turn on phantom power on your desk. You can also drop the input level. So if you're using this on something really loud like a snare, or an electric guitar amplifier, you won't have any problems using this. It's been a staple on my channel for the last six so or so years. It's, I've recorded probably a close to, I don't know, 500 videos with this microphone. And it's definitely stood the test of time. They're built well, and it's a great all-rounder. And this definitely won't pick up anywhere near the same ambient noise as the Rode NT1. Now, if you plan on recording electric guitar, which I'm sure a few of you will be, I can highly recommend either one of these two or the Rode M3 that I showed you just before. So this is the Shaw SM57. This has been an industry standard now for about 40 years or something like that, a long, long time. It's an end address microphone, so you basically place that grill against the amp and you'll be good to go. This one is the Sennheiser E906. It has a couple of little EQ options down here. Now, these are just both as good as each other, but they sound different to each other. This is a bit more of a sparkly sort of sound in a way, and this is more of a fat mid sort of sound in a way. It also has a good sizzle to it. They've both got their own unique character. I actually use both of these on my cabs to get the best sound possible, and then I get a blend between them both. But if you're gonna go for just one, just go for the cheapest, which is the SM57. This will probably do the job fine for you. I doubt you'll have any issues. Now the setup process couldn't be more simple. We essentially take the sound card out, find the USB port. They always come with a provider cable. This is my old unit, by the way. So we plug the square side into here. The rectangular side goes into any spare USB port on the computer. To plug in a microphone, we first take this end right here, which is the male end. As you can see, it's got the pins on the inside. Simply plug that into the front. These go in a very particular way, so what I suggest doing if you're new to this is to just turn it until it feels like it's about to fall in, and then just push it in until it clicks. Now, if you are gonna be using a condenser microphone of any description, you do need to remember to always have the phantom power button on or phantom power switch on which usually says plus 48 volts. If you don't have that enabled, this isn't plugged in right now, by the way, otherwise it would light up. If you don't have that enabled, you're not gonna get any sound out of the microphone, even if it's plugged in. So just make sure phantom power is on. And just a little bit of a pro tip, make sure you don't push the button while the studio monitors are on really loudly or your headphones are on really loudly. Otherwise you're gonna hear a massive pop or sort of a, an explosive sound. So yeah, just make sure it doesn't, they don't all do it, but just be cautious of that. It's not a good move. Let's talk a little bit about studio monitors. Now, I almost don't feel like it matters too much what kind of studio monitor system you run. Whether it's Atom Audio or KRK or Yamaha or any of these other brands, they all essentially do the same kind of thing. Now, you just don't wanna to go too big for a really small room. So if you've got a really small area that you're gonna be recording and producing your music in, get something with like a five or a six inch driver at the maximum. You don't really need any more than that. If you've got a larger room or you just want a bigger set of monitors, then look for the seven inch drivers or the eight inch drivers. Now, usually on the back of these monitors as well, you can adjust some of the parameters, including how loud you actually want the, the speaker to be, as well as changing the high 
uh, frequency and low frequency. So it has a, a switch here where you can change them up. Now, depending on the room and the position of them, you might find they're a little overly bassy. When you compare your mix, say on the studio monitor to, to say something like your car. So you might just wanna switch down the low frequency, for example. So most good studio monitors will give you that option. You can also plug them in via uh, auxiliary input, or you also get the full balanced input. And I use these cables, but we'll get to those in just a moment. Just to let you know, the best studio monitor out there is the one that you actually learn. You might be saying, what do you mean learn? How can, what can you learn about the speaker? You'll learn their character. Each of these brands have a little bit of a different character. I really feel like these Atom Audio T7Vs are a lot more balanced than my old Rocket KRK8s. Are they better? Maybe not, but they definitely are a little bit easier to mix on because all the frequencies are there. I used to find on my old set of KRK Rocket 8s that it would really undersell the bass in the mixing stage. And when I put it in the car, I was like, man, the bass is so loud. Like, what happened? Where did that come from? So I learned to go, okay, so that's way too much in the car and that's what I'm hearing in here. Let's pull that down and I learned how to use those monitors. So you'll learn to use the monitors, whichever ones you get. I just really feel like these Atom Audio ones are a little bit more balanced compared to my old ones, but they're definitely not as loud. And they definitely quite aren't as punchy as the old Rocket KRKs either, but I've learned to sort of live with it, learn to work with it, and they're actually really fine now. While I'm sure not every set of studio monitors out there will have this particular input cable, but if it does, definitely buy this one, or you can just get two ends like this, and that will work fine as well. I'll leave all the details for this particular uh, jack to XLR cable in the description below as well. But essentially, this side goes out of the sound card like this, Plug that in and then this goes into the back of the studio monitor. Nice and simple and these cab type of cables are very reliable in terms of just their actual grip inside, inside the socket. I really prefer these. Now I'm just going to give you a couple of pro tips now on what you should do when you're actually recording. Now I've got my microphone hooked up and I'm talking into it and you don't want this peak light to ever light up. So if I was to turn the gain right up, you're going to start to notice that the light is coming on on the front here, which means the signal is going to be distorted. So keep that at a safe level. Now, depending on what type of microphone you choose to use and how loud the sound source is, you have to make sure you've got this at a level that's never peaking or clipping. You can also check this visually on Reaper as the input levels will also be spiking and clipping on there. So it should never hit zero dB. This next tip's for anyone who wants to say record an acoustic guitar and then they might want to sing over it or add some harmonies or whatever. So you're going to be recording over something you've already pre-recorded. You want to use this control here. This is the input to door mix. So DAW on this side means you're going to hear back just what's being played back from the computer. And all the way this way means it's going to only hear the input signal coming into it. So you want to get a mix so you can still hear what's coming back in playback versus what you're recording. And it's as simple as just turning this left or right to get it to where you like. Now, if you're recording with say a condenser microphone, turn the studio monitors down and turn the headphones up and use some headphones for those uh, recordings that way. You don't need headphones on the first time you actually lay down a track unless you wanna just set up and make sure the mic's fine. But yeah, anytime you're dubbing over yourself, you'll need to make sure you're using this mix here and getting a good input to door mix. Now I'm gonna show you how to make sure you've got Reaper set up correctly so you can start recording and making your brand new song. So if you go up to options at the top here, we can scroll down to preferences. Now this is really important, otherwise you won't get any sound recorded to your computer and it'll be an absolute headache and nightmare. So you just wanna make sure on this audio system tab under devices, so you can see on this sidebar menu, we've got general project and then audio. Click audio or right under it is devices, which is what we want. So go to ASIO here, A-S-I-O, audio signal in and out. Make sure that's uh, selected by default. It's usually direct sound, which I think is Windows driver. So you wanna make sure you've got that set to A-S-I-O. Under that, you'll be presented with a drop-down menu. Make sure you select the sound card uh, driver of your choice. Mine being Yamaha Steinberg USB ASIO, which is the audio driver for my particular model over here. Now, if you've got a Focusrite or another brand, you'll see a different one in that list. So just choose the right one and make sure that enable inputs is selected here below it, because if you don't, you won't be able to record either. So just make sure those are connected. You don't have to worry or clicked. You don't have to worry about anything else on the left. So just hit okay and get out of that. Now if we take a look at the program. This main area at the top is where you'll see your waveforms. Down below we have the mixer. So the project will be in this big area and the mixer slash sliders and all that kind of stuff will be in the bottom area. But we don't have any tracks. 
So if we want to actually start recording, we can either right click and click insert new track, which will pop up a new track, or we can use uh, control T and it will bring up as many tracks as we like. Reap is great, we can make as many as we need to and do infinite overdubs as long as the computer can handle it. Now to make sure that we're recording via the actual input that we want to record on, we have to right click on this little light. So we right click on that and we scroll down to input and then see how we have input one, input two. Input two is always the secondary one. Input one is always the one at the on the far left here. So just make sure you've got that selected if you're plugged into that one. Now, if we want to test our microphone, you might be saying, hey, nothing's lighting up. What's going on? We actually have to arm the track. So if we arm it, but just by clicking that, we can see we already get some input uh, gain levels coming into the computer and into the actual program, which means everything is good to go. And then we can start recording using this button over here. Now I'm not gonna hit record because it's just literally hit it and then you can stop it just by hitting it again or hit the stop button. It's really that simple. So Reaper is a really great program to get yourself started. And I, I can highly recommend it for people who are just getting into it based on its price and performance and stability and the amount of updates you'll get with it. So. Rather than using the software you get with your audio interface, I can highly recommend just using something like this. It will serve you really well long term. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening. My name's Shane. If you have any questions about different types of sound cards, microphones, or how to hook stuff up, leave your comments and questions below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Learning to record and learning to produce your own music is definitely an advantage. It's helped me not only produce albums for other people that have made the blues and roots charts here in Australia, I've also mastered some music which made it onto Triple J, which is a nationally syndicated uh, radio show here in Australia as well. So I've been lucky over the years and fortunate to put enough time and effort into learning how to mix and master my own music, as well as to produce it and arrange it and all that kind of stuff. And it's really good to get into. If you're looking for something to do as a pastime, or you just wanna just have some fun and record, you can get into it and there's so much you can learn along the way. There's so many great tutorials out there. Don't get too suckered in straight away to buying plugins, even though some of them are really good. You just want to make sure you understand Reaper and how it works and how to mic things up properly before you get into any of that. It is a bit of a rabbit hole and it's something you'll learn over the years to come. But if I look at my first album production versus my last album production, they're light years apart. It sounded like someone else completely made my last album, whereas that first one sounded like someone, some dude in his house, which is what it was. So yeah, you can get so many great results just by doing this and it might open up opportunities to record other people along the way if that's what you want to do. Thanks again for watching. My name's Shane. If you have any comments or questions, leave them below and I'll get back to you. Catch you soon. See ya.